ended up working for um, uh, Steven Spielberg. One day I was scratching away at my drawing and I looked up and there were two guys standing above me. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was uh, Paul McCartney and the other okay yeah and the other person was uh, George Martin hello everyone and welcome to this year art podcast I'm your host Ross Baxter if you want to grow as an artist and learn what it takes to make it as a career start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything Today we're going to be diving into the world of education in Australia. Most importantly, we've got an incredible guest for this. We have uh, Simon Ashford on the show. Simon, it's a pleasure having you on. How are you doing? Good, thanks, Ross. Uh, thanks for the invitation. This is uh, this is this is very exciting. I've never been on a <laughs> thing like this before. So. Thank you very much. Anytime. Um, and the great thing about Simon is I know Simon, so it's going to be a fun conversation. And uh, I've had the pleasure to do uh, teaching uh, for the amazing school, as you can see on his shirt right now, Call Arts. Uh, so we'll be diving into the greatness of their school and uh, everything about education and events, you name it, on that side of the world. Um, uh, but as always, Simon, we'll start off with good old introductions. Tell us a wee bit about yourself and we'll take it from there. Right. Well, um, my ex accent's a bit of a mess. I'm originally from Devon in the UK. Yep. Um, and um, how do I get to Australia? Well, first of all, I had to get out of Devon. I went to, I studied at Leicester Poly. I studied graphic design uh, with a, a sort of a, an animation specialization. Um, and I had a, a, a great time doing that. It was a uh, it was, you know, I'd done a two-year foundation in 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 Devon, which was fantastic. It was a bit of everything, um, you know, everything from sort of, you know, life drawing, photography, ceramics, everything, and it was it was great. And I don't know if if they'd still do that system in the UK, but it was fantastic. It set me up, and I decided that you know, um, making images and um, you know, illustration and graphic design was the thing that really excited me. And I, I'd and I'd actually uh, what got me into animation was I'd I'd late night at night I was watching a documentary on um, the Scottish animator Norman McLaren. Okay. Who um, and it, it was that epiphany moment for me when. I looked at his work. He was he was active in the the nineteen thirties, forties, and fifties, and he had done this extraordinary fine art, experimental type stuff. But he applied it to a, into a commercial setting, and he he he'd done some 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 beautiful work for the General Post Office in the nineteen thirties. Um, he ended up. Uh, in 1939 going over to Canada and was was instrumental in setting up the the National Film Board of Canada uh, and Canada as we all know has got a, a very strong animation culture well it all came from Norman McLaren yeah and um, anyway I, I saw his work and I went wow this this is amazing you know I, I understood animation to be you know uh, Warner Brothers, Tex Avery, um, you know, Tom and Jerry, um, you know, that's, and then of course, Disney. Of course. Um, and that's what I understood animation to be. And then Norman McLaren and the National Film Board of Canada just blew my mind. So I went, let's have some of this. So I went and found a, a course where I could do graphic design and animation. And that was, that was at Leicester at the time, um, 1986 to, um, 1989. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a long time ago. And was really fortunate. I when I graduated, um, animation in in the UK was going absolutely gangbusters. And despite my slightly fine art leaning to my animation and, and graphics world, mm -hmm. uh, was able to get some, you know, taken up by the studios that were uh, um, going up, happening in, in, in London at the time. So I started off uh, um, working in commercials 
and and just literally just bouncing around commercial studios doing you know quick little scenes here there and everywhere and that was great because you do one minute you you know you're animating some special effects next minute you're animating yeah just a just a cartoon character or whatever you know and i did a lot of stuff like you know coco the pop coco um pops monkey mm-hmm. um and uh you know and there was just lots of lots of stuff i did a commercial with barry white okay um sort of kind of kind of kind of cool um ended up um working for uh the legendary animator richard williams yeah which was astonishing this you know, is insane. Like, yeah it was the the richard williams studio was uh the pinnacle of animation in the world at that time and i was um a fairly self-assured young person so mm-hmm. i went and knocked on the door with my with my show reel and you know i, I had a, about you know eight months sort of commercial experience you know in what a studio how a studio works um and was you know given the job working on the thief and the cobbler which was uh, astonishing yeah um and to be kind of, I always sort of describe the Richard Williams studio as it was a little bit like signing up for the SAS. Okay. It was, it was, it was an elite studio. Um, we were um, expected to work very, very long, hard hours. Um, you, you know, you pretty much just shut up and got on with the job. You know, we, we, you know, when I talked to my students about the kind of kind of working conditions, they were pretty good, but they were very, you know, like I always sort of say, you know, uh, they promised me uh, uh, short money and long hours. Yeah, and no they, certainly delivered on, they certainly delivered on that promise. We would work from about nine o'clock in the morning, I think, uh, all the way through till 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And we Gosh. did that five nights. Yeah. And then at the weekend, you went and did a half day, which was sort of, um, you know, uh, nine until about four-ish. <laughs> yeah. Everyone and listening, then, you, you, you should be glad it's changed. <laughs> it's a lot more relaxed these days. Oh, has it? Yeah, but well, anyway. Well, that, that's a, debatable, that his, that's that's a debatable, debatable topic. I better not say that just in case. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and, it, and we, we, I basically sort of, sort of had all my meals there and it was a phenomenal opportunity to work with some amazing people yeah. um you know dick williams himself was you know this crazy genius and um there's no taking away about that and i noticed the other day that uh, the art director uh, at richard williams which was the legendary uh roy nesbitt um okay. He was he was the art director on 2001: A Space Odyssey, and he was also um, Richard Williams's right hand person. Yeah. Uh, he passed away sadly um, a few days ago. I think it was last week. Right. Okay. I, I didn't know this. Yeah. Um, and astonishing gentleman. Just a, a you know he was he was the voice of reason and and calm in in the storm that. Was generally surrounded uh, Richard Williams. Yeah. If anyone knows much about the uh, the legend that is Richard Williams. Um, anyway, that was that. Uh, that project famously ground to a halt when the uh, the backers Warner Brothers. Yeah. Um, it, it was unfortunate never got like, made. Like it never got finished. Yeah, and if if you haven't seen a document, the the the, the brilliant documentary. Um, the persistence of vision, the greatest film never made. Yeah, It'll tell you the whole story about uh, the thief and the cobbler. Um, you know, had extraordinary experiences while I was there. Um, one day I was scratching away at my drawing, and I looked up, and there were two guys standing above me. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was uh, Paul McCartney, Paul- and the other, what? okay, yeah. Uh, and the other person was uh, George Martin. Right. And and I, I I was kind of stunned. And he t- 
turned around to me and he said, hi, I'm Paul. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know. What's um, the chances of that? And yeah, and, and amazing. Um, another evening I was, I was working late and there weren't too many people around the studio and there was a ring of the door and um, I kind of went, not you know, when I opened the door and I, hi, oh, and this guy, you know, this sort of interesting looking bloke was there and he had this amazing jacket on, this leather jacket on. And he said, oh, hi, I'm, my name's uh, Roger. I'm, I've, I'm doing the music on the film and I just thought I'd, I was driving past. I thought I'd pop in and, and have a look at the film. And I said, oh, well, this is the world, funny world. It's like, oh, well, you know, Dick's not here at the moment, but yeah. oh, well, come in. And the idea that you would just let someone into a film studio and let them walk around and show them things is astonishing. You know, yeah. just, just doesn't help me do anymore. Anyway, this, he was a lovely guy and we were chatting away about music and whatnot. And wandered him around the studio for an hour, showing him, you know, line tests and things. And anyway, I said, look, you know, oh, well, if you give them, if they give the office a call tomorrow and they make an appointment to see Dick and whatever, yeah. I mean, yeah. And as he left, I went, "See, mate." And this guy popped, put his head out out of uh, one of the cubicles we work. He says, "Do you know who that was?" And I said, "Oh, his name's Roger." He says, "Yeah, I know. It's Roger Waters wait, from uh, Pink Floyd." Oh gosh, right. Wait, wait, how come? How come there's so many? How come there were so many famous people coming in? Was it just literally people like wanting to visit? Is that literally why? Yeah. Well. You know, there were lots of, you know, that's the thing when you're working on films is that there are famous people yeah. sort of in, in in the mix. And, you know, um, there's always, you know, famous actors walking in and out of the place. And you kind of get kind of used to that after a while. If you're, if you're at all starstruck, being around a film studio is probably not the place to be. Yeah. Um, you know, so that was that. So, you know, that famously came to an abrupt halt, um, you know, and uh, the, the men in suits came in one day and said, pencils down, and that was it. And yeah, uh, you've never seen a, an animation studio get, get stripped of its hardware that bad quite so quickly. In yeah. all its, I'm, I'm staring at my uh, electric pencil sharpener that may have found its way out of the uh, the office that day. Yeah. Um, but... You know, and then uh, where did I go? I went and worked for, did some more commercials, ended up working for um, uh, Steven Spielberg um, over at Amplimation. Oh, my um, gosh, I wish I had that opportunity. <laughs> well, they're there, they, you know, the opportunities are there. Yeah, but what was it like? It was, it was that was fun. It was um, very much more kind of considered an, an, an orderly, kind of studio mm -hmm. uh it was much more along the lines of of what a a big um animation studio is run like you know there was um uh very very structured very orderly um you know uh, we didn't use the term pipeline then but it mm -hmm. was absolutely we used pipelines um you know, there were uh, we worked in teams of people. You know, we'd have the lead animator, and then you'd have senior animators, and then you'd have your assistant animators, and then you'd have your in-betweeners, and you'd, you'd work as a as a as a band yeah. to work on certain characters and certain scenes, and that was great. And it was at the time uh, this was ninety four um, Spielberg. Uh, I worked there for a couple of years and, uh, or maybe it was only about a year. We worked on Balto. Balto, yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, it was at the time that Spielberg was setting up uh, DreamWorks with um, uh, Geffen and um, Katzenberg. Um, and they were relocating the whole amblimation studio we were essentially universal universal yeah. ambling and that was getting relocated out to the states um and i was really not keen on going out to the states because you know I'm, I'm from devon i'm a surfer yeah um and my career had kept me 
away from the ocean for way too long. And I was really just looking for a way to um, improve my, my quality of life. Um, because working in animation in London certainly wasn't contributing to that aspect of, of my life. And I, I put in an application, the guy next door to me, actually, in my next cubicle. Okay. Um, he was uh, a lovely, lovely guy uh, called Axel Stuttgart from Denmark. And Axel had a, an Australian girlfriend. And uh, I think he was trying to work out ways to, uh, uh, his, his, her father was trying to work out ways to get her daughter back to Australia. So he faxed him a, uh, a job ad for an animation studio in Melbourne. Mm-hmm hoping that Axel and his girl and his girlfriend would, you know, would, would come back, relocate back to Melbourne. But he, Axel was having none of it. And uh, he handed me the job ad. He says, you want to go to Australia? Here's a, here's a job for you. And I looked at it and went, great. Wait, is that who it actually kicked off? Amazing. Awesome. And, you know, I, it was, it was, there was no internet. Yeah. There was no email. There was, I, I literally remember just going, you know, okay, I'll write them a letter. And I just went, you know, I just, wrote them you know yeah um and literally kind of went up to the corner shop and faxed it back to them because i couldn't obviously do that from amblin yeah and um four months later uh i was thinking oh what am i gonna do you know hadn't you know just you know don't really want to go to the states um you know i wasn't too sure where where what what life was gonna have in store for me but anyway I got this call at four o'clock in the morning from um, the studio in in Melbourne, um, uh, and they gave me a, a brief interview at four o'clock in the morning. Gosh, okay, uh, that must have been an experience. Um, yeah, it was like what, um, and like I said, I, I had a, a fair amount of self assurance and blag and. As part of that interview, I said, "Oh, look, you know, if if I come out, um, I I really need a job for my for my for my girlfriend at the time." Yeah. And and they said, "Oh, what does she do?" And I said, "Oh, well, she's a production manager." And they were perfect. Bring her as well. <laughs> and I got off the phone, and my girlfriend said, "Who was that? Who's that on the phone at this time?" And I said, "Oh, I've just been interviewed for a job. We're going to Australia in yeah. four weeks." <laughs> and she went, what? That's and, brilliant. Uh, and and, and uh, anyway, she was, we, that was great. We came we came out. And we um, helped set up a, an animation studio here in Melbourne, working on uh, on a TV series um, uh, that was uh, a thing called the Silver Brumby, and it had a live action film with um, uh, with uh, Russell Crowe. Um, and we were doing the animated version of that. And yeah. Russell Crowe was was a nothing actor back then. Back He'd then, okay. Been in a couple of things, and you know, and I just, and I, I vaguely may have heard of him. I don't know, but anyway, and, and I ended up getting to work with a lot of uh, really well known Australian actors through that. Um, the lovely Bud Tingle. Um, he was a classic Australian character actor. Okay. Um, there's a number of other actors. Sigrid Thornton, maybe these are names that mean something. To uh, I, I know I know Russell Crowe, but it's, it's always, <laughs> this is such an interesting podcast. Like, they, here, they, these are the stories that I just crave. Like, they're just, like, there's nothing better. Like, I obviously I know, like, you have your passion for surfing, etc. So all kind of linked up, etc. But it's like, taking that kind of leap of faith to just give something else a try and yes and obviously like you said like it was in the same career field and that but sometimes it just takes that 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 next level of confidence to just you you know what I know it sounds crazy but let's give this a go like it and like like that's that's probably one of the most like best stories I've heard on the podcast and I've done a lot of podcasts so well I think sometimes you know opportunity yeah. is a fleeting thing yeah. um, and I often about this and i also i relate this to my well, my teaching now yeah and i see students waste an opportunity and they go ah that's 
not going to come back again. You, yeah. Ne- it's it's you've just got to dive in. And I was I was terrified. I I I remember being on the flight coming out from the UK to Australia, and I remember being terrified, thinking if this doesn't go according to plan, you know, um, I wasn't that sure of myself as an animator. Um, right. I was pretty, I uh, still pretty junior, you know, when I was working at Dick Williams and, 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 um, at Amblimation, I was, I was still, you know, an assistant animator at best. Okay. Um, you know, and I was on commercials, you get to do everything, you know? Yeah. And did some did some really fun work in commercials, but really and truly, it was like my God, someone's got enough faith in me to fly me out from Australia to, to Australia to work for them, mm-hmm. and they had seemed to have more faith in my abilities than I did. Yeah, I remember being on the flight, just terrified. But anyway, that kind of worked, and it was great. And it was, and I'm still, you know, very much in contact with that group of people. Yeah. Um, and you know that that studio was a was a was a really special time. Met some great people. Um, that was all through the nineties. But there came a point when I realised life and life was changing, and the and the world was changing, and people were starting to talk about this thing called the internet and uh, emails. And yeah, I, I was seeing computers. We we did uh, at at Amblimation. There was uh, they were starting to do some digital ink and paint, but not much. Okay. Um, when we got to Melbourne, that was that was that was actually the clincher. Is that they they had um, Animation Works was the studio and, uh, the, on the Silver Brumby, and they had the first digital ink and paint set up uh, in Australia, and I'd was like wow you just need to embrace the technology and I know it seems ridiculous now but it was like computers to do this ink and paint thing that's that's crazy business um, we were still drawing on paper but it was still like I was intrigued by that yeah but then um I, I thought well you've just got to future proof and I was offered a job um doing computer animation it was like Sure. What's that? I don't. <laughs> I don't know what this thing is. Yeah, of course. Um, but they said, you know, it was this games company, computer games. And I wasn't a gamer. Um, almost nobody was a gamer back then. And so I got offered this job, and they said, right, okay. It was another leap of faith. And they, I remember them sitting me down in this office, and they had this computer, and and they had this pile of manuals. And I thought, right, I've got to learn how to use a computer. You know, no one had computers. Yeah, there. nobody had no any had idea. Home. And so I went, okay, how hard could it be? So um, I had a Photoshop manual and I had uh, a 3DS Max manual. And, I, and they said, look, if you can, we'll, we'll pay you for six weeks. Mm-hmm. And if you can use this stuff at the end of six weeks, we'll keep you on. Oh, Otherwise, gosh. you have you have no job. Yeah, and it's like okay, that's fairly motivating. So I just knuckled down and just would just go through these manuals, these Photoshop manual and the Max manual, and also I, I did literally at the end of my first day, I didn't even know how to turn the thing off. And it was like yeah. this guy walked past, so, excuse me, mate, how do you turn this off? He just like, oh, you come over here and you. He's like, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so, so naive. But at the end of six weeks, I nutted it out and they gave me a job and I, that lasted for a, a few years. And then that, weirdly enough, transitioned into teaching. You know, I was, I was showing people how to do stuff. and That's when it all began. I kind of enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was looking for another change and short story long I was offered a job teaching and because I I was making computer games and I, I'd been making you know animation for tv series and things like that yeah and it wasn't 
really my jam you know it was like i was making a product that i didn't really care about yeah so i had an epiphany when i took on teaching i thought well i'll do that for a bit until i can work out what what i want to do next and literally at the end of my first day i went wow this this is this is the thing it's the best thing of all time yeah, and I just went, I love this. Yeah. And I had no idea how to be a teacher. I just thought, I'm, I'm, I know stuff. I can explain it. And I just threw myself into the craft of, of teaching. And that's really been my life ever since, that I'm always trying to work out how to be a better teacher, yeah. how to make connections. I think the thing is, I'm good at making connections with people. And I think... Definitely. Yeah, anyone can know stuff, but and that's that's the easy bit. It's how do you make connections with people and how do you... I'm fascinated by how do I get the best out of somebody. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, you can have a room full of people and you're thinking, right, I, I and I loved uni myself. That was ultimately it. It's I think it's important to find your why. Of course. In life. And I was very fortunate that I had some tutors um, that I absolutely adored and they were life changing for me. Um, I was, I guess, I was sort of one of those people that I was the first in my family that had been to higher education. Yeah. And it was a big deal. And it was like, for me, it was like, wow, someone like me can go to a place like a university. Yeah, that wasn't a thing that people in my family did. No one from my background. Yeah, you know, I was. I was, I was the same as you. Yeah, because I was the first person in my family to go to uni. <laughs> so it's uh, it's, it, it's crazy when you think about it. Thing. From now on, on the Sure Art Podcast, I would like to showcase your artwork on the show. All you have to do to have the chance to have your work on display is share your favourite portfolio piece as an ArtStation link or Vimeo link in the comments section below. Before we get back into the podcast, I just want to say thank you to our Patreons. Recently, I've started a Patreon page to help bring better quality podcasts for you, and I'm looking forward to growing our community of artists to help you get one step closer to your dream job. If you would like to become a patron of the Shunart podcast, you can find the link in the description below. Let's get right back into the podcast. Yeah. Wow, what a start! Thank you so much. This is incredible. This uh, there's there's so many things that you've done, and just the fact that this is this has been your journey, um, to becoming a teacher. Like obviously, folks, that's one like that is the main focus we're gonna be diving in today is education. As it says on uh, Simon's top uh, shirt right now, call arts. That's what we're gonna be diving into. But just hearing his story and obviously Steven Spielberg, all this incredible things like to get him to that point it's it's always the best part to hear um so when it comes to i guess like let's get rolling let's talk about call arts so what is call arts like give us the give us okay. the, the whole introduction <laughs> right call arts uh started off as a uh, an audio uh school with um music performance music production mm-hmm uh, and it was it it was it, it was uh, my wife was actually working there uh, teaching um, entertainment journalism okay. and uh, and I was working at another institution uh, it was very kind of similar and I was observing the culture of color arts for a couple of years and I just every time I I pop in it just had this really cool vibe you know. All the staff was zingy um, that, you know, you could tell the students were having a really good time. Clearly, I've got some sort of musical kind of background. Um, And it was, I just went, wow, I really, really want to work at Collarts, but I'm I'm not a good enough musician to (laughs) to offer me a job. Um, And that's not my first thing. And I, I was, asked to help develop the 3D animation course with mm-hmm. our partners, CG Spectrum. And I literally went, well, I'll help them. Uh, adv- I was, you know, asked to be an, uh, uh, um, an advisor on that. Um, and that was great. And so we got the course up 
uh, but I still wasn't employed by Colarts, and I thought, well, I'll I'll apply for the job to um, to run the course, and yeah, they 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 gave me the gig. And this is, was in twenty eighteen. Cool. Yeah, and was, again, it was another leap of faith. Of um, I was very very comfortable in the classroom. Um, I'd also gone down a slightly other different path in my old job where they had um, uh, paid for me to train up as a life coach. Okay. Which was kind of interesting because it was, I figured that often there's teaching and I was interested in that process of teaching and, you know, throwing around terms like pedagogy and andragogy and all of those, all those sort of educational structures. This is like theory. Um, at Gallup. Is this um, Gallup. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. It well. Gallup is the uh, Gallup Strengths is the modality that I was. I was um, working in. Okay. Uh, I was working for an organisation called Billy Blue, which is a, a, a sort of a well-known well-known design school in Australia. And so, yeah, I was. I was working as a, a coach. So it's that thing of, you know, I'm no longer, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been teaching typography. That was my other love and passion, which we'll get onto at some point. Yeah. But I was, I was, I, I was really interested in how people learn and how do you get the best out of people? So that was something I've been doing for a couple of years. Carts came along and I was like, you know, I'm really enjoying this coaching thing. This is really cool but I really want to go and work for you because you, I'm liking the culture there. Yeah. And I went, okay. So it was literally again, a last minute leap of faith. I, you know, the day the job was closing, I just literally threw them a, um, uh, an application. I really am as, as disorganized and as, as, as kind of self-assured as that. Um, and they, they gave me the job, which is great. But the thing that was really interesting for me is it was a 100% online course. And I had no idea how on earth do you teach online? How do you do this? You know, the, the classroom was my happy place. Walking into a classroom and making connections with human beings is something that I enjoyed. Yeah. Um, still do enjoy. Um, and, you know, sitting down and having conversations about design and, thinking is the best creativity. part <laughs> yeah totally and i was thinking well how do you do this online i i literally had no idea and i was terrified um and i had a course to write you know it's like it's 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 it's, it's a long involved process to write a course from start to finish and you have and you literally start at the start and keep going you know you have a a sort of a basic plan yeah and we were literally I, I, I the analogy um of that the dean said to me at the time said we um we've 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 ordered all the materials and you are going to build a boat as you sail out of the harbor yeah and you're going to be standing on one plank of wood gosh yeah well it's, it's... <laughs> and, on you go. It was terrifying. But I think I think that's the beauty of it, though. Like sometimes, like it goes back to like as you can see, there's this common thread through your career is that you've seen something and you've like trusted your gut, and it go like like I always believe in like I, like I've always followed my gut. Every time I've had that gut feeling of this isn't right for me or this is right for me, it's it's always it's always um, led me in the right direction. And I think so many people can learn from that. Like, yes, it's mm. great having maybe a certain stability in your life, or maybe it's a certain like you have say you have a certain income, and every, life feels maybe you're, you're you're in your comfort zone. But unless you you find unless you know like and it's all about being happy, as as cliche as it sounds, and I say it all the time, but it's it's crucial. It's fundamental and. It goes back to what you're saying there about teaching, like and like the environment of call arts, etc. Like it was your calling, and that goes back to Gallup as well. And I think this is something that I think is imperative to talk about is the fact that you focus on people's strengths. So, um, and like you don't 
yes, like we all have weaknesses and it's great. Like weaknesses are also strengths as well. But when people are, I guess, are new to maybe, maybe new to university and yes, it was online for you, but it is quite daunting to do that. Um, to like uh, um, get into a new scene and like, you're meeting new people for the first time and having a teacher who focuses on your strengths straight away can really help build that early confidence to to get you comfortable and um, so I think it would be yeah. important to talk about like what's your thoughts on that like what have you learned by focusing just on strengths um I think it I think for the first time, people like to to be seen for who they are. Yeah, strengths training basically works on on the premise of uh, working. Uh, you know, we don't go into weakness fixing. Uh, yeah, you know, you you know, you we we work with what this is going to sound such a cliche. So I turn into Tony Robbins at this point. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's you work with what's strong rather than fixing what's wrong. Yeah. Um, and people come into your classroom and they are all uniquely wired. You don't have, you don't put people into pigeonholes. You don't use the glasses sort of empty kind of, yeah. you know, the, the empty vessel model. People walk in and my, my instinct is, wow, what have you got? How do I find out what it is? And how do we use that to get you to being the best version of yourself of course and it takes a while to build people's confidence up we've got some tools some coaching tools that we use to get to that point and it's a slow process you can't i can't do it overnight but um and i think it takes a couple of years really so i introduce it in bite-sized chunks throughout the whole course um and it's when it works and when people are open to it it's astonishing and it's life changing. Yeah. Uh, when I did my coaching training, it was um, one of the, the the biggest epiphany moments for me. To it, it unlocked everything, and it was um, I was sort of advanced in 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 my years when I discovered it. And the first thing I just went, "Wow! I wish I had known this in my twenties." Yeah. Because you find out what, how you're wired. It's like you get your own sort of user manual for yourself, you know. And, so true. And you say, what, one of the things you said, what does it say? You said um, you, 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 about your weaknesses. You say, oh, you, your weaknesses can be strengths. I would, I, would, I would refine that and saying knowing what your weaknesses yeah. are can be a strength because if you – if you spend all your time fixing something that you're not good at, of course, you ignore all the stuff that you're really good at. And it's really nuanced stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and without going into a whole sales pitch for Gallup Strengths, there's 34 facets to it. And they use a fairly sophisticated tool. You know, people go, oh, it's Briggs Myers. And uh, Briggs Myers pigeonholes people into, into very sort of, categories okay or, you know segments around a circle or whatever what gallup strengths does is it works out you, there's 34 facets of of behaviors and um it works out what is really dominant for you yeah and then it's all of the things that sort of sit slightly underneath that are useful to know but yeah. everything at the bottom irrelevant you just you don't even worry about it you're curious but you don't you you know i don't i don't even it, it think about my weakness yeah no nah, not at all um and so i'm always digging into this so one of the one of, for instance one of my top strengths is i have this thing called individualization okay and literally it translates and they because it's the whole coaching languages takes a bit of translation but it's it's I have a fascination and an interest in individuals and people. Yeah, same. So I get to take that into my workplace every single day. And when I get to do the thing that I'm naturally wired to do, mm -hmm. I do it I, I enter my flow zone really quickly. It's natural. Um, if I can I can do the stuff that's at the bottom 
you know, like a pet competition is is my is my thirty fourth. Okay. Right. So, I I can be competitive, but it's really hard, and it's like I can do it, but it's not. It's more of a hindrance. It doesn't benefit yeah. you. You don't feel it's right for the person that you are. Yeah, that's right. I can yeah. do. You can, you can. You can all do the stuff at the, at the bottom of the list. But of course, the stuff that I'm really good at, and also I'm not very. I've always alluded to the fact I'm fairly self assured. Self assurance is different from from arrogance. Yeah, and. And it's it's a it's closer to confidence, of course. But it's um, and self assurance is actually quite high for me as well. as it's one of the, the, the facets. But when you, it's it's not easy to be able to say what you're good at. And what the thing Gallup Strengths does is it actually gives you language to articulate what you're good at and to instinctively know know what you're good at. Yeah. And I don't think any of us are really good at knowing what we're good at. Yeah. Well, the reason so I, I layer that into my teaching quite a bit, and that's quite unique, and that's been life changing. Like I said, I had an, an epiphany. I went, "Wow, I wish I'd known this when I was in my twenties. It would have yeah. saved so much, saved so much time." Heartache. But that that said, I'm I'm really fizzing on it now. So and it's and it's great. No, that's good. Because so. so the reason why I wanted to focus on this because I feel like it's it's crucial. So for example, with me. In order for me to perform at my best, um, I'm not sure what facet this would be out of the 34, but like I need to control the pace. So when I was um, in studio, etc., I, I always struggled because of um, all this concept of speed, and I knew that I needed to then switch switch the flip, um, switch uh, the switch. How can I say it? But basically, go self-employed, and by going self-employed. I was able to find the best version of me and therefore help more people. And um, I'm, I'm li- literally just like yourself, like teaching is my favorite to do, helping people. And I just geek out with there's, there's no better feeling like you just said there, right? It's the best thing about teaching is when there's somebody, I say it so many times on the podcast, when somebody's a wee bit nervous, they, they join your class and then suddenly you just sit down beside them and you just start geeking out about the same thing they're geeking out and they just like blossom. They just instantly come out of their shell and like that's like to me that like the best thing about teaching is when somebody just you just see it they just light up and yeah. I, I think like there's no better feeling but yeah like, I think I think it's crucial like you said so focus on your strengths try to figure out where like what's best for you like I like I struggled so hard um when I was working in the industry yes I I, I I would like to say I'm pretty good at working with people. I like working in teams and stuff. I love teaching and stuff. However, constantly having to work almost like a machine, it wasn't it wasn't for me. And um, yeah. this is why I think it's vital to to trust your instincts and um, like we're talking here, figure out what you're good at and just be honest with yourself. And yes, it might take a leap of faith. Um, and it takes a bit of confidence to to take that that leap, like Simon's done many times in his career. But once you do that, you're going to be at so much ease. Like it's the best feeling. Like yeah. I, the amount of stress I no longer have. Like I, I don't. I, this is a boss. I, I don't really stress anymore. Like I've ever since I've I've left, um, what I did previously and started my own business. Everything's changed. Like I'm, like I get to. One, I get to help people every day. It's my favorite thing to do. Uh, B, um, I get to just like I, I don't know. I'm just like what you said. Like you find your your moment. You find like like the place that you wanted to be. Like call arts was your calling. Like you had you had music. You had uh, teaching involved. You had uh, focus on like strengths teaching. You had everything in one. Yes, the the difficulty was the online teaching aspect, but we'll we'll talk about that in just a second, folks. But this this is so crucial and. If it takes you a few years, if it takes you a decades, then so be it. But just don't stop going for it, because it's mm. um, knowing yourself it's, is amazing. Yeah, it's fact, crucial. I'm, I'm curious because I always look at people through a strengths lens. I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll uh, okay. I'll take you. I'll take you through my coaching course. Okay, here we go. I'm ready. Well, I won't do it now because it take it take take it will. We'll, it's a it's a separate session. We'll do, okay. do this. Deal. On the, okay, it's a it's a it's a promise. I'll. 
we'll arrange a time and I'll take you through it. But I, I often think, oh, what, what can I see in here? Yeah, you know, I, I, there might be a bit of developer in there. Developer means you, you in like you, you enjoy developing other people. Like you, yeah. you, you like to take somebody and, you know, for me, um, I don't particularly have developer but other stuff, but my my job is to make people better than myself. I, yeah. When I see when I see teachers that are competitive and they're threatened by their students, mm -hmm. I kind of confuses me because I'm like, what? Yeah. If I do my job well, one of my students in a very short space of time will kick my ass. Yeah. It's and so true. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> and that's I'm totally fine with that. It's yeah. totally fine with that. But you know, I've got things like I've got learner, so I'm I get really I need to be constantly learning about stuff, and that's Same. what makes me is I get en energized by learning. But I've this other thing which we call input, which is I'm gathering resources, and information is a resource, so I gather information and I do it in a practical way. Okay, so I I I, I will hoard information. Um, I've got hard drives all over my desk. Oh, I'm just saying, so, I'm books. I'm obsessed with my books. Like books are my favorite thing. You've got input. So people that gather, collect books. And I used to do that same as well, but I've moved around a bit. So I do it yeah. in other ways. You've got input. So that's when we did this coaching thing, uh, a, con a constant or a consistent thing with everyone involved with education is they all had input they had learner and they had input yeah really interesting because it means that when you do that you go oh this is a great piece of information i need to have a book on this or i need to read this mm -hmm. and then i'll store it away because it'll be useful yeah it'd be useful for yourself it'd be useful for other people it's it's this input thing and it's it's amazing that's we'll do this Ross. We'll, well, we have to we'll here i'm up. i'm saying up i agree this is great um, as as always, folks, as well. Um, if there's anything, uh, I'll make sure to share uh, all links um, as always in the description below um, of everything that me and Simon have been talking about today, so you guys can learn it too and uh, get involved. So yeah. obviously, we've introduced the basics of call art, but let's now dive into um, the actual animation VFX course. So okay, cool. Um, for just as a whole, um, like how, how would you describe the course? Like what does it entail? Okay, it's uh, the, the course title. It's a Bachelor of Animation and Visual Effects. Okay. Um, it's a 3D course. Um, whilst I've got a, a 2D background, I guess I've, I've certainly had uh, uh, a, a lot of experience with 3D. Um, the thing I, I need to mention as well is that we are in a, uh, a really interesting and unique partnership with an organization called CG Spectrum. CG Spectrum are amazing. A lot of people might have heard of CG Spectrum. Yep. Um, CG Spectrum are uh, essentially run by two Canadian guys. They both live in, in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, recently uh, won the or their accolade is they were the second best uh, online animation school in the world. So that's, oh, wow. that's okay. pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, it's the number one. Everyone goes, well, saying you're second best is like, who cares? But the number one was Nomen. Yeah. Uh, is it Nomen? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love Nomen. I, Nomen was game changing. So I will admit Nomen is good. It, it changed. Uh, it actually helped me get my, uh, my first job in AAA. <laughs> Right, there you go. Well, you know, no one's up there. Yeah, spectrum. awesome. So we we run the course with them. Um, so they uh, provide us with materials, which are highly polished um, and upstate materials, which the students work through. Mm -hmm. And they provide us with mentors. They essentially run 50% of our course. So they take care of all of the practical stuff. Okay. And myself and my my actual team, um, we run the uh, business units and theory units, um, and so they run all the way through the through the course. Um, so in the first year, which is a the diploma year, there are twelve units. 
uh, CollArts runs six of those and CG Spectrum run six of those. Um, we teach them the basics of 3D animation. We teach them the basics of 3D modeling. Um, they get the basics of um, uh, using uh, Houdini for visual effects. Um, and uh, they also get a little bit of Unreal Engine. So after the first year, they've uh, had some rudimentary units with myself and my team, you know, things like, you know, animation, uh, history and theory. Um, they've got uh, production design and art direction, stuff like that. Okay. And so CG Spectrum teach them the practical how to do stuff yeah. and we will teach them why you do that you know so in the second year hopefully they've made some decisions about they really love modeling or they really like animation or visual effects is is fascinating or they might want to go into a uh, lighting and compositing stream and so they pick a stream and then they follow that stream, but they still continue with us. So they will do another uh, six units with us and they will do six units with, with CG Spectrum. So effectively it's 24 units. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it's, 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 and it's worked really well. I was, I was wondering how, how on earth online education works. I had this, this strange moment. I was, I was about 20 minutes into my first class and I was thinking, wow, this is kind of strange and weird. And I, I'd done what I normally do. I created my slides and built the sort of the journey, introduction and ask questions and try and yeah. get some interaction. And after about 20 minutes, I kind of was like, I was on the edge of my seat and I was like, oh, this is no. And after a while, I just leant back and went, this is the same as being in a classroom. This is great. Yeah. And for me, and we did this a year before COVID. And so I've been working at CollArts for a year and my, my, you know, the first few cohorts were going through and everything's going great. And the boss said to me that this is going really great. Let's do this on campus. I went, sure. Okay. Let's, let's, we can do this on campus. So we'll work it out. Yeah. Um, and I was more apprehensive about how that was going to roll, but that's okay. We, we I just, went, just again, we'll work it out. It'll be fine. We were si literally six weeks into it, and Friday the thirteenth of March, COVID. It actually was Friday the thirteenth. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it was the chances? And, it was, and well, that's right. And it was we we literally pulled the pin. It was on the Monday. I was. I was looking at, I was watching, watching the news very closely and yeah. I was, and we were, I was in and out of staff meetings and we were going, you know, everyone's talking, well, if this goes horribly wrong, what are we going to do? And I said to my students on the Monday, I said, I don't like the look of this. <laughs> Go home. Yes. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, you know, it'll all blow over in a couple of weeks and we'll be back to normal. But I think we should all just go home, yeah. stay safe, you know, buy lots of toilet paper, whatever you need to do. <laughs> um, and and then on the Friday the 13th, everyone else pulled the pin and then we, we went home for, a, you know, the best part of a year. Yeah. And um, But the great thing for us was we'd already worked out how to teach online. The kids liked it. Um, you know, it meant that they weren't wasting their time commuting. Um, and I had students all over Australia and some international students that were um so I was able to just combine everything together and it was like great and the strange the really the strange thing about online education is that when I meet a student that I only know in an online environment when they walk onto campus um they're visiting Melbourne or you know a lot of them you know uh, are online but they don't come onto campus particularly if they need to but okay what they sign up they walk into campus and i'll just walk oh hi how are you going and there's this instant thing we've got the same bond yeah um that when you make a connection with somebody it's 
it's really easy. It's like I feel like I know you quite well. With yeah, we've 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 only like we've only talked um, just to give people a wee bit of context. So I've um, Simon reached out to me uh, last September. Last September, around that time. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've come across your um, your YouTube channel. I went, this guy sounds interesting, and I watched <laughs> a few of your, your things, and I thought, oh, this is. I'll just send him send him an email or yeah. something. I'll just, I, I just thought oh, I want this guy to come and talk to my students. Yeah, I think I think and that's it, the. Oh, on you go. I'll let you finish. No, no, go on. Well, I was just to say, it's like it's it's interesting. Like when it goes back to what you said about. Um, uh what's it called what's the word um gallop uh, so like the how we all have different personalities like i feel like i've known you for years like i feel like i could talk to you like non-stop it's, i don't know I, I don't know if it's like a personality thing or whatever it's just because we share obviously the same passions and stuff but it goes back to what you said there about your students and stuff it's just like you just know when it just it's going to be such an easy conversation or example like for example like do you know when i'm doing podcasting i can just tell right at the start right do I need to be more energetic to boost the guest's um, confidence or do I have to be a bit more quiet? Because I can, I, like I say every time, I, I get carried away because I get so excited by just the stories and stuff. But instantly when I uh, reached out to you, I was like, yeah, this is going to be one of the easiest podcasts because I, it's just easy, so easy to talk to you and it, it makes the conversation flow even better. So it's perfect. Well, I think both of us have um, got the ability to talk under wet yeah. cement. But, yeah, we like a good conversation. <laughs> we don't get bored easily. <laughs> As my family so, puts it, yeah. I can talk to a wall and never get bored. <laughs> but yeah, look, and so for me, it was, you know, online was was really good. And I, here's the thing. The thing that I knew why I knew it was going to work yeah. was um, I was getting online guitar lessons. Okay. And I found I found this really great, online guitar teacher I, tr- I tried having lessons in different places and it wasn't working and every now and again you know, i've been playing guitar you know most of my life and you hit a wall you know i just need something just someone to just get me over i needed more coaching than lessons and i i discovered this guitar teacher if you any of you are guitar um players just I, I i started working with uh justin guitar and okay. He's a, he's a Tasmanian guy that's based in London. He's got this, and he's he's this incredible guitar teacher. He's got this lovely, lovely style to him. And I went, oh, and I went, oh, actually, this is working for me. And I was, I was really, I thought, wow, I can. And here's the interesting thing. This is going to sound a little bizarre, but no, no, far I away. Surf. You know, I, 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 I've been a, I grew up in Devon. I came to Australia because I was surfing, you know, surfer. And you know, I've been surfing for 40 years. Yeah. Um, and just up the road from where I live, there's there's a wave pool. It's the first wave pool in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a bizarre place. Just check it out. It's called Urban okay. Surf. Okay, awesome. May, 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 it's the real deal. It's, and... Um, so I started surfing at night. So I, I got there at nine o'clock at night and surf from nine till 10 o'clock at night. It's what an experience. And okay. it's amazing under lights. It's incredible. But, you know, I was thinking, I was at a point in my life going, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm sort of like, I'm a cruiser now, you know, I'm just, then I went, actually, I'm actually getting better. Yeah. Which is great. And I was thinking, this is bizarre. So I started having online surfing lessons. Right, interesting. So you can always learn. You know, I've been in the water for 40 years. You know, it's yeah. like, I was like, you know, like I'm an old salty sea dog, you know, like there's nothing I can really. And I would say in 12 months, um, and bear in mind, we had a COVID lockdown in the middle of that as well. Yeah. So during COVID, I was watch, I was getting surfing lessons online and not actually getting in the water. Yeah. Man. And so I've got a I've got a couple of surfing coaches that I use. And um, I'm thinking, wow, if I can learn online how to play the guitar, which is a very visceral, emotional, personal thing. Yeah. And I can also learn to surf, which is a very physical kind of 
thing and it's also very emotional and very visceral and you can learn anything so and oh sorry i was gonna say like so i have all your experiences then so to kind of base things since you started uh, if you had to give advice to te- people who are teaching right now like what have you learned like how 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 do you create the best online experience like what if, or is there certain things that um that you can't control and uh, uh and what things you can control to make it easier mm-hmm. <sighs> or do you think it's feeling like do you think it's just it's just it's it's the same like there's like it goes back to what you said there you think there's not much difference do you think people overcomplicate I don't, it? I don't think there's the, the, there's a difference in so much as different tools and you know, I th- I think education is entertainment. Okay. And I, I think it's a personality thing. I think you learn from people you like. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm likable, <laughs> just but if if it's. Um, I've I'm, I'm thought about this a long and hard of what is working. I think I show interest in people. Yeah. And I think that's important because you make connections with people. Um, I think you've got to make it interesting for them. Um, it's it, it's often it's about telling stories too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, I, and I, I'm still, honestly, I'm still trying to pinpoint what it is that works. So I, I go to educational uh, PD days and we talk about what works. And we've got a fa- fabulous dean at yeah. Cull Arts. This, 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 he's just blows my mind always. You know, he's, he's, he, he, he understands education so well. And... Um, and we break down kind of how education works. And I hear all these theories about this, that, and the other. And I go, oh, how do I, how do I apply that? And I'm doing something, but I often don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think it's enthusiasm. And it's about keeping it interesting. I have a slight, yes, I have an educational plan. And I, you know, obviously I've got lesson plans and all of that sort of stuff. And I've got a, a general path. But there's also a level of um, spontaneity in in what I teach. I suddenly go, yeah. oh, good idea, and it's like, and then I think when you do that, you 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 get excited, and then then the people you're teaching get excited that you're almost forming a thought as you're speaking. And I think, yeah. So I try to stay off my scripts too much. I agree. I do have scripts, but I've got enough structure and script. Just not too to, much, the right balance, basically. Yeah, um, and trying to take an interest in your students, you know, and sort of saying, what do you think? What do you like? Tell me. Because I think it's the thing about I've, I'm completely comfortable with teaching a room full of people that probably know more, more about the thing than I do. Yeah. And so I just start asking them questions because – there's nothing like teaching to actually help you learn. And so the students start telling me stuff and then they're fizzing off because they're, they're kind of, yeah, they're, they're telling others about stuff they know. It's that back and forth. I don't think I've answered your question very well, but no, no, um, I, think I, I actually don't know if I, if I had the magic thing, yeah. like students often say to me, you change, you, you, it all fell into place for me once because I keep in contact with all my ex students. I've got this Facebook where they all live in this one group and there's, there's several hundred students and sometimes you know, they'll contact me and I say, you know, you know, I, you were my favorite teacher and, I, yeah. and, and it's great. And I, I've also had the opposite. I've also been people's worst teachers. Well, so. <laughs> we all have, there's always one. It's okay. And, we all have our moments. <laughs> and they'll say, and they'll say, it's, it's this, t- you said this one thing to me. And I go, what is it? What is it? Cause I need to know. Cause I want to bottle that. I want to be able to yeah. work out what that is. It's always something different. Yeah, it's, it's never the consistent thing, and it's um, yeah. They... I, well, I think you did answer it, and I, and, it, and it's going to sound maybe so simple, but it's so. I, it, I think the secret it was that you were just you, like you 
like you were just being yourself and you focus like you you're in a, in the environment where you thrive like in terms of f- helping people no matter what like you focus on adding value all the time and like teachers are always doing their best to try and get their best out of their students and figure out how to put them in the best possible situation so they can get the job or career that they're aiming to aiming to pursue and i think you just it's like it goes back to that concept that i was that we were mentioning earlier was like your gut instinct like there's that so there's, there's three parts of the brain there's and then but there's this one part of the brain so obviously you've got your neocortex etc but there's the main part of your of your brain which tells you if something just feels right and it's that part of your brain when you that kind of builds that connection and i think it's 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 always hard to explain like what is like the perfect form like there's 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 no there's technically no such thing yes we all we can give guidance and stuff but at the end of the day it's 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 your it's your charisma your your energy to to do the best for your students that results in them performing better like i think yep. like the, the 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 last thing i'll say before we move on to the next question is that i think so many people i even said it when i was doing the the presentation for the class was I think we absorb far too much information or like we we're surrounded by so many people giving opinions these days that we forget to, to focus on ourselves like we we like like I love doing my podcast I love helping people but doesn't mean I know everything <laughs> like I don't know I know everything uh, I, like I, I never will no exactly I have no to know everything exactly like um however it's it like the only way you're going to find out is by doing and that's why I do it like I know that like my, the thing I enjoy the most is helping people hence why I do the podcast etc and I'll keep doing it but the, the one thing that never lies is your gut so I'm like it's never failed me yet so if you ever feel like just something doesn't feel right where it's the the, the module or something or there's something that you don't understand say say for example Simon was teaching something in a class like uh, and I didn't understand it don't be afraid to ask him like I understand. Oh, like, I think so many people get afraid. To, like, I, I say, like, it's the re- it's the main motto of my podcast. Like, don't be afraid to ask. It goes back to what you said earlier about people not taking opportunities. Like, like I've, I've, like, I will say, like, like, for, if somebody messages me, right, like, um, or for example, I say on the podcast many times, like, have you, have you sent me a message, a personal message on LinkedIn? Like, say you connected me on LinkedIn. Like I will respond. Like I will always respond because it took you confidence to do that. But the amount of people that don't take certain opportunities, it, it always boggles me. I, I like there's there's so much opportunity there that you have a chance to take. If you know what I mean? Yeah. One there's, the thing I will say about that is there's there's only one stupid question, and that is the question you didn't ask. Yeah. Yeah, I completely uh, agree. And also, I'll be in a seminar and, you know, sometimes I'll be there and someone will say, any questions? And if I've got a question that's something I really need to know, yeah, I always think, ask it. And most people are afraid to ask questions. I'm never afraid to ask a question, even if it's a really rudimentary, daft question. Yeah. I know there's somebody else in the room also has that question and they're too afraid to ask it. Yep. And so I, Hey, I'm, I'm never afraid to ask a question. I'll never say it. Cause I'll just go, I will even paraphrase. I'll say, Look, yeah, you just got to ask geez, it. If this is a silly question, but Hey, let's, let's, let's get it out there and move on. If it's a silly question. Yeah. And I also know, that when I've given, when I give lectures and I'm there and I'm pontificating and I'm going, blah, 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 blah. And I love it when, when a student says to me, I've got a question. I go, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Exciting love times. <laughs> We've got to lean in and go, yeah, what, what is it? What do they say? What's the question? What's the question? <laughs> well, and I might know, and I might not know. And there's part of me, part of me goes, oh, crap, what if I don't know? Yeah. But that's part of the excitement. <laughs> I'm not afraid of not knowing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's oh, you've made me remember of a a, a famous story. So there's this very um well-known um uh, like he's a philanthropist entrepreneur uh, called Simon Sinek. 
Um, well, I know. Simon Sinek loves Simon Sinek. Amazing. I'm reading his book. Uh, um, uh, start with why. Start with why. It's so good. It's literally just around there. It's uh, I'm reading at the moment, halfway through it. Amazing book. But he had this very. Um, it wasn't his viral uh, video, but he had this famous um, kind of presentation he was giving. So basically, he was telling about this story about he was surrounded around this table of about fifteen uh, exec- um, executives. And he was invited to just sit down in the room. And these are like billionaires all around this room. Like we're talking insane, uh, like successful people. However, the funny thing was, was there was this um, consulting firm uh, giving a presentation. And uh, basically, um, uh, the guy was giving his presentation and he finished it. And Simon was just sitting there. Everyone else, else was in silence. And he was like, Hi, I'm sorry. Can you repeat what you've just said there? I I just don't quite get it. And the guy giving the presentation was says, "Yeah, sure, of course." Um, so the guy repeated um his presentation, and then Simon was like, "There, I'm sorry, man. I, I still don't get. It. I'm not trying to be a pain. I promise." And he then said again, and it took him Simon Sinek. This is in front of all these people that you're that all these so called, uh, very successful people. It took Simon Sinek three times to admit that he did not um, get it for everyone else in the room to admit they didn't get it either. And this was like another yeah. billion dollar, um, like this was a massive investment. Like if they did not accept, if Simon wasn't there to be like, um, as, as, um, as the title of the video yeah. goes, is being, it's okay to be the idiot in the room. Like that's the title of the video. Um, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they, they, yeah. They would, yeah. They would have lost billions. Like it goes back to what you just said there about the questions part. It's like it, I don't know if it's just a personality thing or it's like, but you you know that they're perfectly. I, I like just don't be afraid. Like don't. It's okay. Like, like who cares what anyone thinks? I don't care what anyone thinks. That's why I just geek out when I when I do my podcast. If I want to geek out about animation or Teenage Mutant Tur- Ninja, Ninja Turtles, I'm going to talk about it. So yeah, um, before uh, yeah, but yeah. Let's get on to the next question yeah, before I get carried love, away. Love, 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 I bring him up. I, I, I reference him a lot in... You He's know, so like good. A, I'm mad for a coaching book. I've got a few fucking around. Oh, um, I love it. And uh, and I and I often borrow out of them a lot. Yeah. And uh, and and layer that into what I what I teach as well. Um, okay, so the next question I wanted to ask... Um, what events, or is there anything in Australia, in Melbourne, etc., or is there anything, obviously I know COVID's around at the moment, but is there anything that's hap- that happens uh, in Australia that artists can go to, or even at Call Arts, that um, that, uh, that you can share? Um, we've got a couple of things, um, okay. which is really exciting because, you know, we've, like I said, we've, we've been in lockdown and it's been hard to do anything. Yeah. And we're, we're fortunate we're, we're, we're coming out of it now, which is great. Um, and it almost feels normal. Um, we've there's one place that I that I took my students to a few weeks ago, which is a place called Fortress Melbourne, and it's an esports venue. Oh, sweet, um, nice. And it's it's so it's 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 got a, a, an esports stadium, um, which was mind blowing. Right, and wow. they and so they got this. Yeah, oh, it's just. Google Fortress Melbourne, that's great. And one of the things that I really, 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 I, I got excited about, and maybe more excited than about anyone else, but they, they introduced us to um, uh, the, I think it's the expression system by uh, a software company called Ross. Oh, and perfect. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's basically uh a a motion graphics system that's um driven by a games engine and so it's on the fly motion graphics so you know when you watch um uh something like cricket or you know okay. maybe uh some some i'll use the term football not soccer as they would say <laughs> in australia um and they they stop the play and you know uh, and the commentators will say right okay and they and they turn the pitch into a graphic and they rotate and they say well if, if he 
kick the ball here and it went here and with that, 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 and they move all, and, and they have all of the on, and they just turn the, the live pitch into graphics. That's the expression system. Or you, you might see it for cricket, for instance, if there's, yeah. you know, if, it, if, if they've, you know, gone upstairs to the, to the, to the referee or whatever, or the umpire. Um, and that's driven by the expression system. So they've got an expression system that they that they layer over the top of the esports, so so that they can turn it into a, a much more sort of presentable broadcast piece of content. Right, wow. And so this, this young guy was was taking us through that, and I I really love that. So yeah. that's one place. Um, uh, and Fortress Melbourne, it's it's not just an esports venue. There's there's a bar, there's a restaurant. There's there's gaming lounges. They've got um, uh, uh, little little kind of pods where people do Twitch streams and podcasts and whatnot out of it. It's an amazing state of the art venue. Okay. And yeah, and they they're excited because they officially opened on March the thirteenth. March the thirteenth was it was it just as year, <laughs> and it was like they opened and went closed. Yeah, instantly <laughs> so, gone again. So my students love that. The other place we've got um, that's reopened and rebranded is a place called ACME, Australian Centre for the uh, Moving Image. Um, and I'm taking all the kids off. Does that sound patronising? Take the kids when you're old. Everyone's a kid when you're <laughs> old. So I'm fine. It's okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah I'm, I'm taking them all off to uh, the Art of uh, uh, Disney Animation exhibition that opens soon so okay. uh, that's that's great so we're gonna go go to that in a few weeks time awesome uh, so that's my 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 two that's your main two because yeah there's there's quite a lot of things happening in australia because obviously the rookies as well they're based in australia with alwyn and andrew yeah, Adelaide, yeah they're in adelaide and uh, that's where my family is as well so <laughs> um there's a uh, it's always great to, to see everything that's kicking off and then obviously you've got um quite a few uh, very big studios over there as well um, mm. Are you able to uh, like to anyone who's in Australia? Like, what what studios, uh, whether it's game or film or uh, e even something different? Like, what what's available um, at the moment in Australia? Uh, where that, do that I you know start? Of? Yeah, 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 look, yeah. I rattle them off. You know, we've got the big ones. You know, there's obviously Method Studios. Um, uh, there's Rising Sun Pictures seems to be advertising there over in Adelaide as well. Weirdly enough, there's a lot of lot of stuff going on in Adelaide. Yeah, it's kicking off a lot over there, which is, which is strange. Um, you know, because you know, in in Australia, we just think, oh well, there's you know, there's Sydney and there's Melbourne and maybe there's Brisbane. Yeah, <laughs> we don't even think about Perth and Adelaide. Oh, when something happens in Perth and Adelaide, we go, what? Yeah, let me get the map out and find out where they are. Yeah, <laughs> it's like um, so. There's a lot of stuff happening in 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 Adelaide, uh, Rising Sun Pictures, um, and, and and of course uh, there's Animal Logic in Sydney as well. So mm -hmm. they're, they're, everyone knows it then. Then um, there's uh, a place in in Melbourne called the Arcade, where it, uh, a lot of independent game studios are based out of. League of Geeks okay. is, is based out of, uh, out of there. So there's a, there's a few things going on for sure. Great. Um, Dockland Studios um, uh, is um, they we they've just announced that they there's a, there's a big studio in you know live action studio in in Dockland. There's a lot of film production happening there. A lot of com countries, a lot of the Americans are coming over to film in Australia because we've done so well with with our our, our sort of kind of keeping covid at the door so to speak yeah um and yeah so there's a lot of film production going on here um to the to the extent that dockland studios just announced that they are extending docklands they're building literally building the 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 largest uh tank stage uh, uh sound stage right in the southern hemisphere so they basically have a big big ass water tank yeah awesome which is sort of one i sort of when i realized that I was like, 
can they all just do that in Houdini now? I don't know. <laughs> do you actually need a big tank of water? Yeah. yeah. Doesn't seem a bit old fashioned. But anyway, um, and as uh, and attached to that, um, they um, Bento Box is coming to Australia as well. So okay. Bento Box is arguably the largest animation company in the world. Two right. D coming to Melbourne. Yeah. So. Um, and, you know, breaking news, um, ColArts is developing a 2D animation course where uh, that's uh, our course writers and developers are working on that um, at the moment. So yeah. hopefully, hopefully we can announce something a little bit more solid around that. Um, I don't know um, what form that will take. It's all kind of in, in development. So that's that's kind of kind of exciting so that that's might be nice. that might be a collaboration with cg spectrum i know they've got a lot of 2d uh resources mm -hmm. um uh or it might be something that we'll develop ourselves or i'm, I'm not too sure that that's outside of my my pay scale that's so, okay <laughs> that, that... Break, breaking breaking news so most importantly, everyone who's been tuning in, I'll be put all the links. You'll be seeing it on the visuals um, of, of Call Arts on the background right now on the podcast, and um, you'll, you can access all the links to um, everything we discuss from the events all the way to um, uh, everything that we discussed in the timestamps as well, so you, you don't miss anything. So you can go back to a certain uh, thing that Simon uh, said, and uh, you can find it there, and it'll be good to go. Here, Simon, it's been amazing having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, Not a problem. And we, I'll, I'll, honestly, we'll touch base. Um, yeah. We'll send you an email and we'll talk to you about this coaching thing because I'm intrigued to know a yeah, bit more about you. I, I'm intrigued to find out as well. It's, interesting. it's always fun. Uh, it's always a good conversation uh, uh, to have. And uh, most importantly, as always, folks, uh, thank you for tuning in uh, to this week's uh, podcast of the Shunart Podcast. Make sure to go check out Call Arts. Links are in the description below. Um, and if you have any questions, just feel free to comment as always. Um, and I'll do my best to get them answered. And um, uh, as always, um, don't forget to subscribe. Leave a like if you enjoyed today's episode. And with that said, folks, we will see you in the next episode. Bye for now.